we'll see how the Lord does that. So, um, yeah, Ecclesiastes, did you find that spot? All right, we're in chapter 4, and I want you to notice just a passage here. And again, this is, this is one of those practical messages um, that uh, I give sometimes. Uh, hopefully, most of them are, have some practicality, I guess, but... Uh, I, I just sometimes I think the Lord just wants me to be very plain because sometimes we, we, we just, I don't know, we, as human beings, we just space it or it goes over our head or whatever. But um, that's kind of where I'm thinking about here. So Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I'm going to read starting in verse number 9. If you're not sleeping just yet, go ahead and stand with me so I can get another 10 minutes out of you. I, I told them, I, this is, this, we're going to try to get this over with uh, relatively quickly before I fall asleep behind the pulpit. So Ecclesiastes 4, starting in verse number 9, two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe unto him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I want to speak to you this afternoon on the blessings and dangers of friendships. The blessings and dangers of friendships. They say, well, friends, that, that, bl friends are always blessings. No, some of them are not blessings. Some folks that you might call friend or that might call you friend are not, in fact, your friend at all. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father God, tonight, this afternoon, we come to you. We're living in a time where we need friends. We need companions. As this passage has told us, it, it, we, we just, we're in a battle. We're in a struggle, and we need folks to help hold us up, hold us accountable, uh, encourage us, strengthen us, and work with us. And yet sometimes the friendships just Sometimes they just get in the way and drag us down. And so help us tonight uh, to be cautious, to be, to be concerned, to be aware of the blessings and the dangers of friends. And I pray that you'd use this in a wonderful way to both encourage and help uh, and also help us to avoid the challenges that uh, will be pointed out this afternoon also in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier this morning, uh, you might want to contact me, ladies, as the week goes on uh, about Saturday's uh, activities. And uh, if we do have it, um, we want to have a, a lunch for those that do show up. So um, we'll, we'll, if you can bring something, if we're going to have it, if you can bring something to share that would be a blessing as well, and uh, well, I'm sure we'll know more by Wednesday night, and we can talk a little bit more to that. But um, this passage talks about companionship, basically. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. Um, and uh, think about uh, husband and wife. You know, t your partnership, your one flesh together and God meant it so that you could get more accomplished and, and, and be uh, productive that way. But it goes beyond that relationship uh, to family relationships and then outside of the home to friends. Uh, and, and, and the thing that we need to just concern ourselves or think about this afternoon is every person that you are connected with, a spouse, children or parents, siblings, friends, co-workers, Every person that you spend time with, that you are connected with in some relationship, is either a blessing or a drag, just to speak plainly. Either that relationship uplifts and encourages and strengthens and helps you, or it drags you into the muck and mire. That's what I want you to think about this afternoon. Because not every relationship should be a friendship relationship. Not every person 
that, that is out there was intended. Yes, God would like them to be our friend. They would like, God would enjoy it. But there are folks out there that are going to be detrimental to you, your spiritual life, your spiritual walk, and, and uh, maybe even the other relationships that you're having. You know, you think about this, husband and wife. If the, if the man has uh, other lady friends, is that going to help his relationship with his wife? Oh, I can guarantee you it won't. And if she has relationships with other men that aren't her husband, and I can tell you right now there's going to be a drag on that relationship. Uh, and, and the truth is, young ladies, if you're friends with a bunch of boys uh, and uh, they're, they're not the right kind of boys, then uh, that, that's going to be a drag. And it's, guys, it goes the same way for you. Uh, with uh, the, the young ladies out there. you got to be careful uh, with who you allow yourself to be connected with because there's a blessing and there's also dangers in this thing called relationships. And I'm just, again, trying to be real practical uh, and, and help you understand something. Um, it's good to have somebody to share burdens with. It's good to have somebody uh, that can be there to help us when we fall. It was just pointed out in our passage uh, that, that not only can they help us up, but that I can help them up. It's good to have someone who's cold uh, or who's close in that cold, dark times and the dark valleys of life that can put uh, their arm around us and can love on us and encourage us. Uh, and not just in a sensual way, but in, in a spiritual way, in, a, in a, just a human way, we need that kind of relationship. It's good to have somebody to stand with us, with, uh, with the enemies that we have to face. Uh, a while back, Brother Parr preached about uh, Moses, and he had Aaron and her uh, that was there to help him. And what if they hadn't been there? What would have come of the nation of Israel if they hadn't come alongside him and, uh, and helped him in that time? It's good to have fellowship. We sat around this afternoon and joined some fellowship. And let me just point out as well, again, that when we have fellowship time, look around and see who's sitting with whom. Maybe go to sit with that person that nobody else is sitting with. And I just want to encourage you to use that time to minister to one another uh, and encourage one another. And don't just, just sit down with the people that you know. Now, uh, you know, you got to be careful. I, I'm not going to go sit down with one of y'all's wives, and I don't expect you fellows to go sit down with my wife necessarily. But, you know, sit down with people that need, you know, sometimes we have visitors. They're sitting off by themselves in the corner, and everybody else is yoked up over here by, them, uh, by groups. And uh, just be thinking about this, the blessings and dangers of friendships. You can be an encouragement to that person uh, or that group of people uh, if you'll consider that. Now, let me, let me go through a couple of thoughts here with you. And again, I'm not going to keep you much longer than, than I have to. Uh, just give you some good and some bad uh, testimonies or examples. Go back to 1 Samuel with, with me, chapter number 18. 1 Samuel chapter number 18, that's back in the first and the seconds, back before Psalms, and 1 uh, and 2 Samuel is the, the first group of first and seconds, and you look at chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, and uh, I want you to start in verse number 4, all right? And uh, this, is, this is a good example. This is uh, something that God used uh, in an encouraging way. First Samuel chapter 18, verse 1, It came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. He loved him as his own soul. Now, there, there is somebody in the world today who's going to take that and twist that, uh, and, and, but that's not the kind of love that he's talking about, a sensual kind of love. Uh, these young men, their hearts were knit together, not as, not, not as uh, intimacy in, in, in sensuality, but as in they watched for one another, they cared about one another, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're talking about purity here. Verse 2, and Saul took him that day and would let him no, uh, go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant 
because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even his, to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. And uh, these two young men had each other's backs, and uh, nothing could come between them for good, for encouragement, for help. And, uh, and, and that was a blessing, the blessing of, of encouragement uh, to your friend. And when, uh, Saul, uh, when uh, David was discouraged, Jonathan was there. When Jonathan was discouraged, David was there. As you study through the life of David, uh, Saul and Jonathan die in battle. Uh, David takes in Mephibosheth, uh, one, of, uh, one of Jonathan's kids, uh, into his house, takes care of him and all that. What the, why? Because he was a good friend, and they were encouraging to one another. Just to think of a bad example, somebody that uh, isn't so encouraging, you think about Job and his friends supposedly, that came after Job's uh, children are dead. His, all his, everything's gone, and he's sitting there in dust and ashes, and his friends are accusing him. Oh, you're just a wicked man. Oh, you just need to get your heart right. There's no encouragement there. Friendships are meant for encouragement, to edify one another, as the Bible tells us. I think about friendship and I think about another good aspect of friendship. Uh, look with me at Proverbs. <clears throat> Proverbs, right before Ecclesiastes, chapter number 27. Just should be four or five pages back, maybe three or four. Proverbs chapter 27, I want you to notice verse 6. And we're going to go to 2 Samuel here in a moment for a bad example. Proverbs chapter 27 Verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Do you realize that God provides friendships and, and wants friendships to hold one another accountable? And sometimes as a friend, you might, you might have to say to your friend, hey, you've got a little egg on your face, friend. Hey, that, that's, not, uh, that's not the way it should be, friend. I'm just thinking about the accountability aspect of friendship. Uh, you should not cover for your friend's ungodliness or wickedness. I've heard several folks uh, in, in counseling, well, I'm not going to rat out my friend. If your friend is wrong, you need to hold him or her accountable for their wrongdoing. Not cover for them. You need to hold them accountable. That's not right. That's not right behavior. That's not the way we ought to act. By the way, faithful are the wounds of a friend. You think friends wouldn't wound one another. If I need a wound, I expect my friend to smack me upside the back of the head or give me a swift kick in the back of the seat of the pants and let me know that what I'm doing isn't right. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes we have the wrong idea that friends are just supposed to smile at us and be nice and pat us on the back of the head and say, oh, it's okay. No, that's not the way friends are supposed to be. Hold one another accountable for what you know is right. Let me give you uh, uh, the other side of that coin, if you will. Uh, back in 2 Samuel chapter number 13. And I'm going to try to move quick because I can see your eyes are rolling in the back of your head already. <clears throat> I can see it. Too much sugar, too much of that dessert. <clears throat> Second Samuel 13, 1 to 5. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed, and he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to say, uh, for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend. Now, you might have heard uh, a message preached about that not, not too very long ago. Amnon had a friend. You, did, did you notice what it said there in verse 2? Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister, he had improper feelings for his sister. He had improper uh, thoughts about his sister. She was a beautiful young lady. She was a virgin. She was good and godly. And it says, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her sister. He, there was something inside of him that said, nope, nope, nope. I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. But Amnon had a friend. I, I wish I'd have counted 
while I was preaching at the county jail, I wish I'd have counted all of the young men and young women in that place that said, well, I was with my friends. Listen, if the kind of friends that you got are going to get you put in a place like that, you got the wrong kind of friends. You're hanging around with the wrong kind of people. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. He was his cousin. By the way, I found frequently in dealing with situations that cousins can get you in trouble just as easily as somebody who's not your cousin, sometimes a little worse because there's a trust factor there. And I'm not talking about you and your cousin. I'm talking about your parents and your cousins. Sometimes parents are too trustworthy of their, their siblings, nieces and nephews. And sometimes that, that relationship is not a healthy relationship. Sometimes they spend too much time there and this kind of thing happens. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. You know the type. They come over, they play in the, in the back of the house or outside, and something happens. It always seems to happen, but this person, oh, well, I saw, and, and, and it wasn't me, it was them. They're subtle, they're sneaky, they're never the one that did wrong, but something always goes wrong when they're around. You've got to be careful. I'm just talking about the blessings and dangers of friendship. Amnon had a friend. And it says... And he said unto him, Why art thou being uh, the king's son lean from day to day, and wilt not thou tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed. And she, he gave him a plan. He figured, out, Hey, if you, if you want her, take her. It seems kind of strange, and I don't want to get too deep into that, but the point is this. Friendship is supposed to provide accountability for doing right, not encouragement for doing wrong. And if you've got a friend that's encouraging, whether he's a family member or, uh, or she's a family member or just some other person, listen, if you've got a friend that's not holding you accountable for right, you need to get that person a little bit further out of your life. Amen would have fit really nice right there. I'm just saying. Y'all know that I just wonder, just real quick, just as a testimony, just make sure I'm telling the truth. How many of you have had a friend that got you in trouble, led you astray, ended up, you, you did something, you followed your friend, you shouldn't have done it? All right, look around, look around. Don't, don't put them down, look around. Young people, look around. Listen, these are old people that got their hand up. Some of them aren't so, quite so old, but... Listen, the reality is you got to be careful. A friendship, true friendship. Ecclesiastes 4, friendship should help you, edify you, make you better, not worse. Back in Proverbs chapter 27. I didn't tell you to hold your finger there, but it's not far from where we've been. Look at verse 17. It says, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. I'm supposed to make, if you're my friend, I'm supposed to make you better. I'm supposed to make you sharper. I'm supposed to help you. I'm supposed to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, sharpen your iron, not make it dull. And to give you the opposite side of that, and I'll give you the point here in a moment. Proverbs chapter 22, verses 24 and 25. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. It says, and this is important. Young people, you ought to look at this verse. Young ladies, you ought to look at this verse. Make no friendship. You know, there are, some, there are some things and there are some people that you should not make friendships with, and there, there are some reasons to not become a friend with certain people. Now, I'm just, again, I'm trying to be practical with you. I'm not trying to be mean, just trying to help you to weigh out which people to become friends with. Now, here's the thing. If you take, and, and I'm just going to 
one illustration, and I've read this and I've talked about people, but if you have one person that has been addicted to drugs on one side of a crowded room and, and in walks through the entry on the other side of the, the room another person that has had problems with drugs or maybe currently does, it won't take but a few minutes for those two people to find one another. And whether it's drugs or alcohol or, or any other problem, they tend, it's, it's like two magnets, so you put them in a room and bam, they come together. So here's the thing, if you know you have a problem, and you, know, and you wanna not continue to have that problem, the magnet's going to be pulling. You're going to, radar's going to go up. You're going to know who this person is, and you've got to decide, no, I am not going there. I'm going to avoid that. I'm just helping you. I want to help you to see, yes, this is natural attraction, if you will, or something like that, where you, you get drawn, and it's just your eyes connect, and, and, and all of a sudden, something's going on there. But... You need to avoid that. Where's that 24? Make no friendship, it said, with an angry man. There's one of the reasons and one of the things that you... Listen, young ladies, you see an angry man? Don't go hanging around him. He's, he, maybe he's cute. M maybe he's strong. Maybe he's handsome. Maybe, maybe he's got a good job. Maybe he's, he's got a lot of things going for him. But God says if he's an angry person, you need to avoid that one. You need to avoid that one. And with a furious man, thou shalt not go. Listen, that's pretty straightforward talk from God, isn't it? Don't go there. Verse 25 gives you the reason. Lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. I told you, friendship should... Here's a principle. Friendships provide sources of education. Are you with me? Are you awake still? Friendships provide a source of education. So here's the thing. If there's a person that's hanging around, and there, all of a sudden you have the opportunity, maybe a new friendship. You need to assess this thing. What are you going to learn from this friend? You're going to learn something. It's either going to sharpen you or it's going to teach you their bad habits and bad traits. I'm just trying to be practical with you. And you need to assess this because, listen, whoever you're hanging around and whoever your friends are, think about this. That's how you're going to become. I don't remember who said it. I, somebody in my young adult life had said this about considering who you was going to marry. And they said, well, what you need to do, if you think a gal's cute, you look at her mom and her dad. And if they're ugly, walk away. Because that's how they're going to look, you know, by the time that the marriage is over. <laughs> I just had to wake you up, all right? You're starting to fall asleep on me. All right? Now, th th that's... <laughs> That's a little cruel, isn't it? But here's the thing. No, let's apply this to what I'm talking about. If there's a potential person that you might connect with and become friends with, and they are a bad actor, a bad character, if they're not somebody that you should become like, then you shouldn't make them your friend. You should avoid them. Right? Right? That's, that's the point. Because you're going to get an education from that friend. And it's, listen, whoever it is, maybe pick the, pick the greatest person and the greatest group of people and the greatest, you know, get around that kind of person. Because they're going to rub off on you. And you want that to be positive instead of negative. You want that to be positive, not negative. Now, let's, let me give you another principle. Let's go to the New Testament for a moment. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. 
Acts chapter 4. I promised you I was going to let you go quick, so I've got, to, I've got to hurry up. This is my last point, though. Acts chapter 4, I want you to notice verse 36. And we're going to take a look at several passages in Acts uh, here uh, and just kind of walk through this, this connection, this friendship. <clears throat> Here's point number 4. All right, let me go through this again. Point number 1. Friendship offers encouragement. Point number two, it offers accountability. Point number three, it provides an education. Point number four, it provides companionship. Companionship. Acts chapter 4, verse 36. Notice it says this, And uh, Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, he was a comforter, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus. All right? Notice the kind of person he was in verse 37. Having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. This was a God-fearing man. He, 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 he wasn't stuck on possessions. Uh, he was a minister type of person. Jump to Acts chapter 9, and look at verse 27. Acts chapter 9, verse 27. So you see a clue about his character in Acts chapter 4, verse 36. Say, well, that might make a good friend. Man, I could use a little bit of, of, of uh, somebody to rub off on me like that. 9, 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostle and declared unto him, uh, them rather, how he had seen the Lord in the way and how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Saul of Tarsus, who became the mighty apostle Paul. And Barnabas was the one that God connected with him as a friend so that Barnabas could rub off on him. Now, understand something. Say, well, see, that shows you that even bad people need good friends. Understand something. Saul of Tarsus had already met Jesus, was pointed in the right direction. And, and when God said, Barnabas, you need to go get a hold of this guy and show him the way he needs to go. Uh, so yeah, do bad people need good friends? Yes, after they turn to Christ. And until they turn to Christ, you better watch out. Especially, parents, with your young people. Young people, you need to be careful about befriending unsaved and especially ungodly other young people. Not that they don't need a friend, but that needs to be a very guarded relationship until they get pointed in the right direction because you could get sucked in a hole by this bad friend. Jump to chapter 11, verse 25. Chapter 11, verse 25. I'm almost out of gas. I'm almost out of notes. We're almost headed to the house. Hebrews 11, or Acts 11.25, notice it says, uh, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. What, why was he going to seek him? Well, for, for some accountability, for some encouragement, for some, hey, Saul, I, I need you to come. We want you to go over here and learn some more, and I want you to be an encouragement to somebody else. Uh, Barnabas was seeking to be everything of a friend that, that Saul needed, and, uh, and, and he was a blessing. I'm just saying we need friendship provides opportunities for companionship. One more verse here, Acts chapter 12, verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So Barnabas got a hold of Saul. He became Paul. Now he's got a hold of God, John Mark, and he's going to be a blessing and an encouragement to him. I'm just saying this. That's what friendship looks like. That's what companionship looks like. The Bible tells us back in Proverbs, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Here's the alternative to that. Here's what friendship should look like. Hey, let's go, Paul, Saul of Tar let's go get John Mark and let's be an encouragement to him. That's, what you, that's who you need to look for in friends. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 33. And this is our last verse. We're done. Hopefully it's been helpful. Hopefully it's been practical. Hopefully you can take this and apply it in your life. 
And uh, now, First uh, Corinthians fifteen thirty three. Fifteen thirty three. Now again, there, I probably could preach in, for another hour on this subject, but I'd be preaching to sleepy people, and it wouldn't be any good, so I'm just trying to keep it concise. Be not deceived. Don't, don't lie to yourself, and don't allow anybody to lie to you. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Communications is talking about com- communion or companionship. He's not talking about word, spoken words necessarily. The, the original language word talks about the connection with people. Right? So therefore, spending time with the wrong people will drag you in the wrong way. It will corrupt you. You need companionship. You need encouragement. You need education. You need everything friendship can provide in a positive way. But friendship also has a very negative and dark side about it. And if you become friends with the wrong people, you become wrong people. So just understand that God has given us his word so that we could know the difference and navigate. And there are some people, he said, go not with an angry man, lest thou learn his way. There are some people that you just need to say, hmm, I could probably be friends with that person, but it probably wouldn't be any good for me. It's kind of like you had the opportunity between uh, 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 cake and donuts, or I saw some broccoli over there, and some peas, and some, some casseroles that were probably pretty good for you, with some, some carrots in them, and I... I, I I didn't see that bowl empty, but I did see the, the, the dessert table was clearing out pretty quick. The point is, God's given us the wisdom in his word to make good and right decisions. And he says when, it, when we do, it's going to be well with us. And when we don't, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back to bite us. Friendships. They'll either be the biggest blessing in your life or the biggest curse. And it's up to you to choose who your friends are going to be. Parents, help choose your kids' friends. Say, oh, I can't do that. Yes, you can, and yes, you should. Did you notice in in Saul and Jonathan and David's life, when David and and Saul and Jonathan yoked up, and, and when Saul as a dad saw that that was a good relationship and those boys are... It said he did not allow David to go to his house anymore. Listen, parents, when you see your kids are making positive friendships, encourage it. Provide for it. Do everything you can to facilitate it. And when you see your kids making wrong friendships, it's unfortunate that David didn't see Absalom and his cousin and pick up on the subtility that was going on behind the scenes there, a lot of hurt could have been avoided if that friendship would have been cut short. Be careful. I know that's contrary to the world and its teaching, and you know, you can't pick your your kids' friends, and you you can't pick your help pick your kids who you're gonna kids are gonna marry, but listen, here's the way I see it. I just open another whole can of worms, but I'm going to close my notebook. I have spent my whole life, my whole married life, my whole life as a dad, raising up my kids, investing myself in them, teaching them the things that, that I thought they needed to know and preparing them. When a dad walks his daughter through the back door and down the aisle, what, talk to me, what is he going to do when he gets down to the front? Give her to somebody else. Shouldn't I have some kind of input in who I'm going to give her to?
granted long before that point it's it's we we've gone down the the road the wrong road a little too far if we've gotten to that point i understand that and and i'm not here to you know we've made we've made some mistakes have we not we've 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 but the point is this just because we've made mistakes in the past we need to learn from those mistakes and not make them in the future so, somewhere we've got to cut the the line of of uh, of bad decisions and start making good ones and uh who my daughters are going to marry become best friends one in the flesh with for the rest of their life that's a very big decision that they probably need some good counsel and some encouragement and some help with so with several of my daughters and I, and I don't, this isn't something I'm forcing, and, and most of them are in the room. You want me to be your helper to figure out which jerk is too big a jerk for you to spend the rest of your life with? I'll be glad to help you figure out which one too big a jerk. You and I can set the threshold of jerkness, <laughs> and anything below that, I'll give you the thumbs up, and, 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 and you'll come back and say, Daddy's a jerk. I knew that. You and I set the threshold, the bar. I just said no to everything that was too high and yes to everything that was below that, and you get to make the choice beyond. But yeah, sure, it's by default. Every one of them's a jerk. But by the way, the women are pretty... Well, anyway, there's, there's, a, few, there's a few challenges there too, isn't there? The point is, here's the thing. You're... Whoever you yoke up with, whether we're talking about marriage or whether we're talking about just friendship, you're going to become like them. They're going to become like you. If you've got a glass of pure water and you're the glass of pure water and you become friends or yoke up with a muddy glass of water, those two glasses of water are going to be combined together and you're now both going to be murky, muddy water. Who are you going to... That's a pretty good illustration, wasn't it? Who are you going to combine with and mix with and allow everything that... Listen, everything that that person is, you're inviting into your life. And I'm not just talking about the marriage relationship, even just friendships. Everything that that person is, is now going to be dumped into your life, good or bad. That's a pretty good illustration. Let me pray with you and send you home. Father, I want to thank you for the day. I thank you for your word, the practicalness of it, and uh, pray that you'd help us to make wise choices and decisions about who our friends are going to be so that we can bring you glory and honor in and through our lives. We ask for your help today to live for you. I pray for your blessing on our day tomorrow, our blood drive, and uh, allow us to, to share the gospel with somebody throughout the day tomorrow. And uh, Father, I ask for your blessing as we travel home. I pray that you bless our homes and our families and our children. I pray that you bless Miss Rachel. I pray that you'd send that, those documents back to her somehow and uh, before the end of the day. And uh, pray that you'd work it all out for your glory and honor. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name.